gracias por uniros a nosotras en este Día Internacional de los Museos 2020. Soy Natalia Gray, soy una de las cofundadoras y una de las programadoras del festival Chica Documentary Film Festival eh, y estamos haciendo este evento en colaboración con Marco, con el Museo del Arte Contemporáneo de Vigo, por este Día Internacional de los Museos, eh, cuya temática este año es la igualdad y la diversidad. Eh, Cheap Cuts es el único festival del Reino Unido y uno de los pocos a nivel internacional dedicados al cortometraje documental en exclusiva y nos hemos convertido en los últimos años en, en un espacio de referencia para, para este tipo de creaciones, para el corto documental eh, a nivel internacional, pero sobre todo en, en Londres y en Reino Unido. Eh, nos hace muchísima ilusión poder colaborar con Marco en, en este programa especial eh, y tenemos preparados eh, tres cortometrajes que han competido en, en ediciones pasadas de nuestro festival. Eh, tenemos el cortometraje de For Paradise, dirigido por Elizabeth Webb, el documental de Kevin Hartley, dirigido por Anne Shannon, y el documental de Giles Ward, dirigido por, eh, por Jay Jackman. Tendremos a las tres directoras con nosotras para, para formar parte de un coloquio, una vez acabada la proyección, así que quedaos con nosotras en este, en este mismo link, porque aquí tendrá lugar eh, la entrevista o este coloquio eh, en directo con las directoras a través de Skype. Si tenéis alguna pregunta o surge alguna cuestión, algún comentario mientras veis las películas, las podéis dejar en la sección de comentarios de YouTube, aquí en este link, y estaremos atentas para poder eh, hablar sobre todas estas cuestiones que os surjan con las directoras a continuación. El coloquio va a ser en inglés, pero si queréis dejar las preguntas en español, pues intentaremos traducirlas también para que todos participéis y, y para poder hablar con las directoras de, de muchos temas. Los tres cortos eh, son muy diferentes, exploran realidades muy distintas, pero tienen un punto central que es eh, explorar la identidad de la mujer eh, en diferentes realidades sociales. Y nos gustaría hablar con las directoras también un poco de, de la diversidad y de la igualdad en el mundo de la cultura y en el mundo del cine y de cómo podemos trabajar para, para un mundo cultural más diverso y más eh, igualitario. Eh, nos vemos muy pronto, las películas van a durar unos 60 minutos y luego iremos directas al coloquio, así que nos vemos muy prontito y esperemos que os guste mucho la programación que hemos, que hemos programado para hoy. Muchas gracias. Alabama, everywhere there's pine. Once there was cotton. By the end of the 19th century, cavernous veins appeared in the soil from years of harvesting cotton and leaving the fields plowed in winter. The rivers turned red from the runoff, and some people said Alabama was bleeding to death. Kudzu vine was brought from Japan as a potential solution to this problem of soil erosion. Kudzu grows quickly and is difficult to control. As an invasive species, it swiftly overtook much of the Alabama landscape. In full bloom, kudzu is the picture of life, but as it covers, Kudzu denies other plants access to light. As it spreads, kudzu kills everything beneath it. Its leaves become too green, its smell too sweet. There's death beneath this Eden.
Okay, take one. I'm going to clap to sync it. Calling Yarl's Wood Immigration Removal Centers. If I don't have anything to do, I'm always in my room. Yeah, they want to make sure I'm okay, but being in here, I'm not okay, so what's the point? I just get along with every day as it comes. And when you see people every day going, you're always thinking, when's it my turn? Is it ever going to be my turn? And things like that. So it really, like, it really messes up with your mental health. Like, I, I had my nose pierced, but then I couldn't get no nose rings or nothing like that. I was so desperate to have some sense of feeling like me again. So I use a state so from the post room. So like the only thing I could do was to just use staples. Because when you're lonely and sad in here, you just feel like you want to find something that makes sense. Being here makes you lose yourself. So I tried to find that little part of me by one by person because I was just so desperate to have some sense of me again. I felt like I've lost myself in here. There are people here that aren't strong enough. They start self-harming and trying to kill themselves because they don't see beyond this place. They don't see beyond the immigration matters because they're just so scared of leaving this country. But I'm strong and I'm, I'm still hopeful. I'm still optimistic. Like they say, freedom is in the mind. Meine liebe Nori, an manchen Tagen bin ich mir nicht sicher, ob ich das Richtige tue. An anderen voller Gewissheit, dass es genau so richtig ist. Aber am Ende irgendwann kannst nur du diese Frage beantworten. Manchmal denke ich zurück und erinnere mich an deine traurigen Augen und deine Frage, warum das Leben so schwer ist und warum du nichts wert bist. Und es zerreißt mir immer wieder das Herz, dass dein junges Leben so schwer ist. Und dann stellt sich für mich nicht die Frage, richtig oder falsch, sondern nur glücklich oder unglücklich. Kein Arzt kann diagnostizieren, was du im Inneren fühlst. 
Keine Blutuntersuchung bestimmt deine Empfindungen. Du wusstest von Anfang an, welchen Weg du gehen willst. Und obwohl ich in die andere Richtung schaute, hast du mich mitgenommen. So hartnäckig, so mutig. Hola, bienvenidas de nuevo, bienvenidos de nuevo a este programa especial en colaboración con Marco de Vigo y Chipka. Eh, tenemos a las directoras eh, preparadas para, para el coloquio, así que eh, vamos a dar paso, le vamos a dar paso a ellas. Eh, antes que todo me gustaría dar las gracias a la Universidad de Vigo por la colaboración y por haber hecho los subtítulos de estos cortometrajes y muchas gracias a Enol y a Inés y a todos los trabajadores de la Universidad de Vigo. Eh, bueno, uh, first of all, uh, I'd like, so everyone can know uh, who you are, I'd like uh, you to introduce yourself and let us know what film uh, you directed. Uh, starting <laughs> with um, Jade. Hi, uh, soy Jade. Um, my film, or Mi Pele Koto, is um, Calling Home. <laughs> Uh, then with Elizabeth. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Webb. I'm an artist and filmmaker from Charlottesville, Virginia in the US and my film is For Paradise. Okay. I'm Anna. Hey, okay. I'm Anna, Anna Sheshong, and I directed um, Mädchenseele, Girl Hearted. It's in English. Yeah, I'm from Germany. Great. So um, I'd like to start with uh, Jade. Mm -hmm. um, If you can uh, tell us a little bit the reason behind making the film and if you could tell us a little bit more about uh, Yard's word for those in Spain that don't know that, that much about it. Yeah, um, so a couple of years ago now um, I studied um, law at the London School of Economics and while I was studying there um, I started doing some legal volunteering Um, to do with the rights of immigrant women, sort of inspired, I guess, by knowing that um, there was less legal funding for, for women who had immigrated over, um, so there had been funding cuts. And I guess I was also inspired from my own family. My mum is Malaysian, and her and my grandma had like come over when she was like 11 so there was that sort of personal attraction as well um and I learned about um detention centers which I know a lot of European countries have but I think the United Kingdom when it was still in Europe um was the only one that detained people indefinitely so it meant that once a person is there they don't have to 
um, ever tell them when they're leaving. Um, so that's sort of what inspired me to get interested. But it it was quite a difficult film to make. I know now since the sort of European refugee crisis happened, we've seen a lot more imagery of um, people trying to get through to the Mediterranean um, or we've seen people on the Texas-Mexican border. Um, But actually getting inside those detention centres themselves is um, illegal. Well, it's illegal in the UK and I'm sure it's also illegal in Australia and they have very strict rules about filming or documenting inside them so it made actually kind of getting those stories out of there quite quite challenging but I think also I was conscious that I didn't want to sort of um, create the same exactly the same sort of quite traumatic imagery that a lot of sort of news journalism or quite a few films had um done like they'd sort of just captured people while they're in that worst moment of of their lives and obviously that's sort of a documentary ethic in it in itself but I think for me personally I question myself a lot about what is the worth of those images does it really impact something or do we like desensitize an audience when we just put a photograph especially out there that um it's quite traumatic to see so although that film does definitely have some difficult uh, lines and sentences I wanted to do something that also spoke to more universal ideas that I thought we could also relate to mm-hmm. um yeah Right. Yeah, I think what, what's very great about your film is that somehow it like moves away from those stereotyped like images of these centres and like it somehow gives that identity back to these women. Like um, they're also women and they're also like doing same stuff that that we do. Um, mm. So thank you very much for the great film. Um, and now um, I'd like to ask uh, Anne a similar question. Um, they. Uh, Nori and her mom seem very, very comfortable on camera. So I was wondering um, if you knew them before uh, started, uh, before you started the film, and how the the idea for the film started as well. Mm. Um, the idea for the film started when I, I knew uh, the mother, uh, Josephine. I knew her from um, a different film project I had back then and we met in 2013 Um, we met again and we were uh, pretty close we're the same age and our kids are the same age now and um, so we had to (laughs) um, quite a lot to talk about and one day she came up to me and said why won't you uh, wouldn't you make a film about my daughter and I wasn't sure why I should do that you know, why would I? And then she told me the whole story that um, Nori was born a boy, but um, very soon identified as a girl and just knew she was a girl. And that was um, a hard time for the mother because um, of her inner conf- conflicts, you know, to deal with that, uh, her child being transgender. And at first she didn't realize what was going on. As she said in the film, she, she didn't know about the phenomenon of um, kids, you know, identifying the, the different um, gender. And um, there was a lot of struggles. And the most problems she actually had were um, not her inner conflicts, but um, what people said about it and the, the whole social environment that didn't agree, um, you know, that she was, you know, started raising her child as what she is, a girl. So, and um, that seemed very, very relevant to me. And of course, that was a gift for a filmmaker that. You know, someone comes up and says, please tell our story because it's so important that the society 
um, knows about that because it's full of prejudices and, and pre-assumptions and, and, and all of this. So that made her world really bad back then. And um, she wanted to go public um, to yeah, just reduce some the, the how you say the prejudices. Mm -hmm. We'll talk later about this uh, things that we're talking about, about representation and prejudices and how can we change a bit that. Um, so I think it's very important that, that that this film is out there and that this film is being shown because it's so important to have um, like references or to have like people you can you can identify with on screen. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, so Elizabeth, uh, for you, uh, we know the reasons behind making your film. So uh, I'd like to ask, uh, what's the most uh, difficult part uh, of when you're making a film about your family? How do you distance your, yourself from family filmmaker? How do you make that difference? Yeah, um, well, I'm not sure that I successfully always was able to do that. Um, I think that for me, again, like the project of making the film was really a way, it was a like because it was on film and because there was this intermediate thing, which is the camera, um, there is a bit of distance and it actually allowed my family to sort of open up more than they than in our conversations off camera because we were all sort of gathering together around this um, collective project, which was the film. It was like we were working on a film rather than working on our lives. Um, and so I think sort of, yeah, the process of making the film was actually the way we distanced. Um, but it was, I mean, the editing process, I think, was the most challenging in terms of, of separating myself because you're watching your family and you're watching yourself. Um, but while I was filming it, it was um, sort of more, it was easier to to just say, like, okay, I'm, I'm myself, but I'm also a filmmaker and, yeah. Yeah, I think it's like, I guess editing is, is sometimes the difficult part for directors that edit themselves, I guess it's the most difficult part to kind of like distance yourself from, from the story and from what's important. So well done, because I, I think it's ended up being a great film. Um, for uh, Jade again, um, I guess uh, your work as a journalist and as a filmmaker has always been uh, linked to women's rights and sort of like feminism. Um, was wondering if that was the idea when you wanted to be a filmmaker, if you wanted to make a difference, if that was your plan? Um, I think it's really interesting because I guess I studied law and anthropology at university and I studied at LSE. Um, I, I think that probably was like due to a little bit of pressure from my parents, like you need to do something academic and, you know, them having anxiety about me getting a job. But I think also what I've realised with that studying that degree that I was just really curious about lots of different things. Like I've got such a wide way, range of interests um, that I think being a filmmaker kind of fits with it because you can flit around with a lot of different um topics you don't have to be fixed onto one thing but I guess once you actually come into the film industry or you even become a lawyer or whatever I think there was going to always be a level that whatever I was doing it felt so unlike what my worldview is you know if you're going to be a top barrister well there's not very many women and there's even less mixed race women and if you go to the female directors there's not very many of those and then there's not very many uh, people who are not white or mixed race there either. So I think then you start saying like, well, this doesn't uh, fit my world, like worldview authentically. And then you want to start putting the stories of people that you want to um, see in front of the camera as well if that makes sense. So yeah, I definitely am like a feminist and very passionate about um, stories that involve women. But I think it also is because I don't feel like there's enough of them. And so it always does interest me, would I feel like this if I thought that there was 
actually good representation of uh, of women on screen or women recovering from trauma or like proper understandings of what violence against women mean I don't yeah I don't so I don't know whether that would have been what I had chosen to sort of to focus on so much but then also I'm like do I want someone misrepresenting the story and it kind of propels you to to want to do it but I would always I always kind of say that those things also come from a place of wanting to like imagine a, a better world and I think also from having studied law when you find something like Yarlswood you really think to yourself like if people knew about it then they hopefully would feel uh strongly about it but at least if they don't um they can't say that they didn't know and I think I heard that someone I can't remember where it was from but it was I think something about the ethics of journalism or why someone continues to um make work on certain topics and I think the idea of sort of changing the world or whatever through film is too kind of high of an aim but for me I would definitely want to my work to sort of exist as like a document and say well you knew these things were happening rather than you had no idea of this perspective or whatever mm-hmm. if that answers your question yeah. <laughs> and it gives you the chance to ask something else so thank you um yeah I just wanted to ask like talking about this if uh, you all think that filmmakers have a responsibility through their art to uh, help towards a more like representative and diverse society or like diverse representation of society on screen uh, starting with Elizabeth or Anne yeah I mean I think absolutely I, I think that every human sort of has that responsibility um, to try to make a more equitable society um, and certainly uh, the artist or the filmmaker has a, a unique capacity to imagine a future um, that's different than than what we have now or what we're moving towards. So I think that it's an extremely important um, role for the artist and the filmmaker. Mm-hmm. But I mean, also for everyone, again. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, there's a lot of important things already said. (laughs) So I totally agree. And I think, I don't want to speak for everyone in, or for every filmmaker, but I think my aim is to, as Jade said, is to, if we can make the world a better place, you know, then um, we should go for it, you know. And a film is a a good... um, uh, medium or uh, opportunity to to show um, the everyday lives uh, of people to to other people, you know, to be part of something you would never be part of um, if it wasn't for the film. You know, you can uh, kind of you, you can uh, participate in and um, yeah, and to see how labels and certain things in life are so constructed you know you can just um how do you say um or show it or or um open it to to the viewers Mm -hmm. was that clear i don't know (laughs) um talking about this uh we've seen a lot of things that the film industry is changing and representation is changing uh do you really think that the film industry has changed and there's more representation on and off camera in the last years Anyone want to I think the fact that there's like a language around it is a good start mm-hmm. I think while we're still in the place where we're celebrating like the first woman to do this or the first black woman to uh, win something at Sundance then like we need to be in a place where we're not talking about the first like to do a gender or race anymore um but I think also it it surprises me how kind of behind people are and I think Lulu Wang is like a really good example of the kind of I don't know if any of you had seen The Farewell which is a fiction film but um you know she was saying that Chinese funders wanted it to be a 
certain type of film because they thought that would appeal to an American audience. And um, American funders wanted it to be in a certain way because then they thought that would make more sense to an American audience. So they were trying to insert saying the main character should have a white American boyfriend that was coming with them. And she was like, but that will totally change the dynamics of the story. Mm. Um, And she was like, I wanted to be able to tell what my truth was authentically, which was it's a Chinese and an American story. And I think that's really where we want to get to where some people who are more marginalized in their identities in whatever way they can tell the story that they want to rather than yes you might get representation but it has to fit into a certain narrative or a a certain box so I feel positive that these things are happening but I don't think we're there yet (laughs) anyone has anything to add I would agree with that um that we're moving in a good direction in in certain ways um but that we're not there yet and there's a lot left to be done and to move from a place where um like a lot of these these roles that are occupied by um people of color women are actually becoming leadership positions rather than um still remaining in like offered to do this from a white man or a network that's led by a board and executive membership of of all white men. Um, So I think that there are a lot of levels of shifting um, that need to be done still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, um, you know, um, there's industries in the industry and um, sometimes I I feel... um, that our responsible uh, responsibility as filmmakers starts to, you know, uh, push other women and to have them, you know, be part of our team and make them visible in the business. And um, that's the big point for me to, to, you know, to get involved with a network with, with women to change things. Uh- Pe Verdial on YouTube is asking, do you think museums museums can serve as loudspeakers to give a voice to social issues like this presented here? So could they work as a platform for social issues and should it be working towards that? I think, sorry, I was just going to say, I think museums are amazing to do something like that because they can kind of bring the past and the present together. I mean, it might be a contemporary museum, but you can kind of contextualise and you just assume there'd be some kind of archive. Um, And I love when you have curators who have such a wide range of specialisation that they can really show like the context where a a theme is going on. So I I think, yeah, museums are great for that kind of thing. I think um, they, at at their best, they absolutely can be a platform for that. Um, I know in the US, there's still a lot of inequity um, in terms of who feels welcome inside a museum and who has access to a museum. Um, Financially, a lot of museums in the US aren't free. And so... I think that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in changing the the whole atmosphere of the museum and what that is and who it's for and who it's serving. Um, again, at like multiple levels, at leadership levels, um, at what is being shown, what is being highlighted from collections. Um, and so, but yeah, I think ultimately it can be an amazing platform to for change. I guess also like in a way, just thinking about what we're doing now, this kind of thing might also be a really great way after corona for cultural organizations to engage a wide variety of people because for example people who might um, have physical access issues can tune in um you've got we've got multi-languages going on here um it's yeah it feels like quite a democratic way with the right kind of reach and warning that people can engage with the cultural program so it, it it i think it will be interesting to see how 
after corona whether people keep up these sort of practices because for example I know like Freeze and a couple of art fairs and museums have made a lot of their work digital which while isn't the same as the physical experience it probably will be getting a lot of um of people's attention and for like the reasons that you said maybe people who feel left out of the space but follow maybe follow on Instagram or see it advertised somewhere on Facebook as well mm. I don't know how we are for time. We have five minutes, so we'll keep going. Um, talking about that, uh, I hope uh, the world goes that way and we work towards more, um, you know, varied representation. But do you think also this, uh, like, COVID-19 situation and the crisis that will come afterwards could also affect negatively to representation on screen? Because, I guess, people from a less privileged uh background uh, will have more problems accessing an industry that is going to be in a crisis. Yeah, I mean, not just to jump in first, please let someone else say <laughs> something, but it's like, uh, I was reading an article that was showing that out of female and male academics, <clears throat> female pub, um, academics have been publishing so much less work whereas male academics have been publishing more and then when you look at the division of labor in this that most of women like women who are also feeling very obligated to like uh look after the children all the time or that the division of domestic labor isn't the same and i think also uh, other communities like psc communities have a lot of other things to worry about as well like the rates of who it's affecting etc and I think that will all have like a an impact um on it okay um yeah yeah, yeah go for it <laughs> <laughs> no I mean I just I, echoing definitely what um what, what you said Jade um and I I think that this uh, global pandemic um it is an opportunity um to rethink a lot of the structures that we have currently that aren't working um and especially in in the arts um i mean i'm also like in healthcare for the us and we have all sorts of structures that need to be uh fundamentally changed um but in in terms of the arts thinking through like the funding structures and the funding inequities that um, have been historically, um, yeah, have, have been in the US um, and that, that often perpetuate and create marginalization. Um, like how can we fundamentally shift those to give opportunities to other people um, and people who have been doing this work all along too. It's like there are organizations that are historically underfunded um, that have been doing amazing, amazing work, but haven't been supported. Um, and so how can we make sure that in this new, in this era where there is an opportunity for shift and, and change, how can we make sure that um, those underfunded organizations and underfunded groups aren't um, still left behind? Um. So because we've run out of time, I'd love to end on uh, if you could give us a recommendation of something you've watched recently that um, you could talk about identity or whatever, like anything that you've liked recently, so we can we can watch it. Hmm. Tricky one. <laughs> uh, um, there's two films that I've really enjoyed, like over this period that I rewatched. One's Tangerine. Mm -hmm. Um, which is shot on an iPhone. So if anyone wants to like get into filmmaking, um, well, not get into filmmaking because he's an amazing filmmaker, but like it's very inspiring to use what you have around you, which is great for quarantine. Um, and I've also really liked The Handmaiden by Park Chan Wook, which I rewatched the other day as well. Kind of relating to identity. <laughs> 
I have not been consuming a ton of uh, media during this time, or at least um, high level <laughs> media, I suppose. Um, but I did yesterday um, watch, uh, there's a PBS series in the US called Asian Americans, and it's the first time that um, that group of people has been profiled on a PBS series in the United States and it's quite interesting and well done. So I would recommend that. It's very, um, from like an artistic level, I think it's, it's much more a standard documentary, but the, the content is really valuable. Mm, I was just thinking, what was I watching? I, um, Listen to a lot of podcasts recently, so I don't know if I could recommend some. They were basically in German, but <laughs> <laughs> I think there's on Netflix there's a good um, new series. Um, uh, it's called Unorthodox. Is it what it's called mm. in America too, in or in English? Um, that was interesting. Me, I haven't seen it yet, but I thought that just got me interested and I saw I just don't come up with the name of it it's um it's a series about the Canadian comedian um May do you know that um she's she's maybe transgender maybe uh, and 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 lesbian and I thought that was a fresh view on, you know, on, on the whole topic. And, um, and I totally forgot what it was called. I binged it actually <laughs> a few weeks ago. It was very, very funny and the fresh view on it. I thought on a, on a homosexual relationship and, and her being trans and, and mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I'm sorry, I forgot, May March. <laughs> That's okay, we'll find it and we'll put it on the link. This yes. is not about me, but I'm also going to recommend something. <laughs> I don't know, like, I revisited uh, Celine Chiama's uh, previous work to uh, the uh. Lady on, uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, and I think she's, like, fundamental for this time. I think she's, to me, one of her best directors out there at the moment, creating uh, super interesting content on identity and many other other issues so um yeah we've run out of time but it's been a great great evening thank you very much to the three of you for letting us thank show you. these amazing films and uh yeah to because gonna switch to spanish now uh if i can <laughs> <laughs> can i say something yes i yes. want to thank um uh, the translators for the spanish yeah, yeah thank you <laughs> thank you and the museum of course and yeah. you Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por estar con nosotras esta tarde en este coloquio y en esta proyección. Eh, muchas gracias a la Universidad de Vigo por los subtítulos, como han dicho bien las directoras, a Inés y a, y a Enol. Eh, gracias al Marco de Vigo por, por dejarnos este espacio y por confiar en nosotras. Y muchas gracias a todos por, por estar con nosotras esta noche. Esperamos que os haya gustado el coloquio y nos vemos muy pronto en el Festival de Chipcats que tendrá lugar eh, a finales de junio de este año. Muchas gracias. Thank you.